Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to try to answer a question of oxygen in some of the planets we might find in the future. So imagine for a second we discovered oxygen on this planet known as TRAPPIST-1b. What exactly does this mean? Does this mean we just found life? Is this oxygen created by some sort of a bacterial life? Or can this be what's known as a false positive? Can this be just a sign of some sort of a chemical reaction? Well, naturally the answer is yes, but what kind of a reaction and what exactly should we be looking for? And so that's pretty much what this particular paper wants to answer. They used several computer simulations to try to create various types of planets similar to planet Earth orbiting a star similar to our own Sun, with very minor modifications of how many different types of volatiles or how many different types of gases are present in the early atmosphere. And then they try to discover if any of those planets can actually create conditions with a lot of oxygen that's not produced by life, that's produced naturally through geochemical reactions. And so interestingly, they've discovered at least three scenarios where it's possible, three false positives. And considering the fact that we've already discovered and confirmed over 4,000 exoplanets, the number that's going to become about 10,000 in a few years from now, and also considering the fact that new telescopes such as James Webb that's going to be released later this year are going to be really good at finding these molecules, it's super important for us to be able to identify all sorts of different molecules present in the atmosphere of those planets in order to establish the origin of those molecules. With the main emphasis of course being oxygen, because we know that oxygen on our planet is produced by life. And if we find a planet similar to Earth that has oxygen, does that mean life as well? And so the scientists in this paper argue against that because they do provide evidence for potential Earth-like planets to have oxygen with really no life whatsoever. But first of all, how would the oxygen be even produced in these conditions, especially when there's no life? Well, generally speaking, as long as you have a little bit of water somewhere in the atmosphere, maybe on the surface, and as long as there's something going on that can break down this water, which in this case usually means the presence of ultraviolet radiation coming from the star, the water will always break down into hydrogen molecules and oxygen molecules. With hydrogen escaping into the outer space because it's a much lighter gas, but oxygen very likely just sticking around for a while and in some cases sticking around for several million years. Now in most cases though, it is going to be absorbed by something. So for example, let's just say we take this hypothetical Earth with very similar conditions to actual Earth a few billion years ago and for a few billion years let it evolve. So it's going to have a lot of geochemical reactions, it's obviously going to cool down and so on, but unlike actual Earth it's going to be a little bit different. In this case, this planet seems to have a lot less water than original Earth. It's kind of patchy in that sense. In this case, the scientists refer to this as the desert world. Now you might actually see this as something a little bit familiar. It does look like the model of that Mars that I've talked about in one of the previous videos. And that's exactly what the scientists imply here. A patchy desert world will actually have very similar conditions to early Earth and will even start producing oxygen as well through geochemical reactions. In this case, because there was a lot less water present on the surface, as the planet cools down from the initial magma stage, it's going to end up releasing a lot of this water as the atmospheric water. And as all of this atmospheric water accumulates, it ends up being broken down by the star, and this produces a lot of oxygen that very likely lingers in the atmosphere for a very long time. Now, eventually this oxygen starts being removed, usually through various geochemical reactions, for example, through various volcanic activity that might release things like carbon monoxide and hydrogen, which might combine with oxygen creating a little bit more water and a lot of carbon dioxide, while at the same time most likely also influencing the surface as well. All of this oxygen ends up weathering the surface, turning it somewhat red to what you see right here on the surface of Mars. So in other words, this is a very interesting model representing what might have been happening on Mars a few billion years ago. But in contrast, if you were to look at our own planet, once the water condensed on the surface, all of this water sort of remained here. The escape rates uh, and the production of atmospheric water were much lower than they were on those other desert planets. And so those desert planets tend to produce a lot of atmospheric water, which then starts to break down into oxygen and remain in the atmosphere for up to about a million years. But remember, none of this is related to life at all. It's just a geochemical reaction. And so this is if you start with a little bit less water. 
But then you can have a condition where the planet starts with a lot more CO2 compared to everything else. This is a slightly different scenario because here you end up with an atmosphere that's much hotter than usual. And because of this greenhouse effect, which in this case the scientists refer to as the eternal runaway greenhouse effect, you end up with a planet where the atmosphere is predominantly carbon dioxide, but also has a little bit of water and starts forming a lot of oxygen as well. And all of this oxygen comes from the fact that any water that was present here could not create any liquid on the surface. The planet was just a little bit too hot. And so it all ends up being as atmospheric water. And because CO2 is a little bit heavier than H2O, H2O starts to move to the top of the surface of the atmosphere. And right there on the top, that's where the star once again starts to break it down into hydrogen and oxygen. And the same cycle repeats again. Although in this particular case, it's very likely that there are not going to be a lot of opportunities for this oxygen to become integrated into something else. It actually might remain as oxygen for even longer, maybe millions, maybe billions of years. And you might have guessed already, but this is exactly what we think might have happened to Venus. Venus, as you know, is extremely hot because of the presence of CO2. Venus also most likely had a little bit of water in the past. And today we know that Venus seems to lose a little bit of oxygen from the surface. This oxygen could be coming from the water that's still somewhere on Venus. And so all of this kind of starts adding up to what we probably had in the past in the solar system. We had a planet with a lot of CO2, we had a planet with the lack of water, and then we had Earth that seemed to have conditions necessary for life to form. But the thing is, what if you find a planet that has even more water than Earth? So that's the third scenario. Imagine a planet that has very similar everything, but just has way more water. A water world. Well, this water world will have a lot of oxygen and nitrogen on the surface, but it's also going to have a huge presence of water that's going to create a lot of pressure, very likely completely shutting down all of the geological activity on the surface. No plate tectonics, very few, if any, volcanoes, and thus inability to recirculate certain parts of the atmosphere. So because of all of this water on the surface now, the oxygen cannot actually get integrated into rocks like it did on Mars. And obviously the water vapor is produced in really large amounts, the water is still being broken apart, and more and more oxygen is being produced everywhere on the planet. There's also not a lot of volcanic activity, and because of this not enough carbon monoxide is produced to try to capture more of this oxygen. And so what you end up having is a planet extremely rich in oxygen, at least after a few millions and billions of years, yet none of this is produced by life. It's really just produced by the water on the surface that's being broken down by the UV light coming from the star itself. And although this planet might resemble a habitable world, and might actually fool us into thinking that there is life here, there's nothing alive about this planet. It's all just chemical reactions. And so these three conditions ideally show us that you can start with an Earth-like world with slight modifications and end up with oxygen in all three conditions, yet no life whatsoever. Three very important false positives. Yet at the same time, if you were to take Earth and to have Earth with exact parameters as we have today, which scientists do in their paper as well, and then run the simulation for billions of years, you would not have oxygen on the planet. All of the oxygen produced on Earth is definitely from life. And we know this as a fact mostly because of the observations from various minerals, from various investigations of fossils in the past, and we even know that some of the oxygen on the planet was very toxic to early life. So by finding oxygen on any of these planets, we might actually reconsider the idea of seeing life there. Generally speaking, oxygen is sort of toxic. Fun fact, if you pressurize oxygen to I believe about 4 atmospheres, it also becomes toxic to humans, which is kind of counterintuitive. But that's a fact that's known to pretty much most scuba divers. You are absolutely not allowed to breathe pressurized oxygen because you're basically going to suffocate. This is actually known as oxygen toxicity and you can kind of learn more about this from the link in the description below. And so the important implications from this study is that when we're looking at those stars and those planets using new telescopes such as James Webb telescope, we really have to look for other wavelengths of light as well, making sure that we identify all of the possible molecules in those atmospheres. If there's oxygen, does it also have a lot of CO2? Are we also seeing the presence of some other molecules that would indicate that all of this is just geochemical reactions? 
And a lot of these new studies that are going to be coming out about this are very likely going to determine exactly what proportions to look for and what type of molecules we should be looking out for if we actually want to identify a planet as potentially living and habitable or just a very interesting, completely natural and uninhabited planet that just happens to have oxygen on the surface. And with so many different planets already discovered and so many different planets that are going to be analyzed in the upcoming missions from the James Webb Telescope, we are definitely going to be finding these oxygen planets all over the place. And I can guarantee that in a few years you're going to hear a story about discovery of oxygen and thus life on another planet. But that is why we have to be really careful when we do discover certain molecules in certain atmospheres. Studies like this identifying exact false positives are very important in identifying what is it that we found and what created that certain element on that certain planet. But I guess until we actually do discover one of those planets or until some other developments, that is all I wanted to mention in this video. Thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who has learned about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description below. Either way, stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.